Hi, my name is Will and welcome to The Salesman Podcast. On today's episode, we're getting into the importance of using strategy in business. Today's episode, today's guest is Troy Sandage. He's an award-winning marketing strategist, also known as The Strategy Hacker. He's the host of the I Digress podcast and is the author of Strategize Up. You can find out more about Troy over at findtroy.com. And with that, Troy, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I've been dying to get on this show. So it's here. It's happening. It's real. <laughs> Good. I'm, I'm glad to have you on, mate. I appreciate the energy, the excitement. And I want to get into strategy. Now, we call uh, over at Salesman.org in our training program, I think me and you are on the same wavelength for a lot of this. We call what you might call uh, strategy frameworks and systems. So I want to uh, get some definitions of this in a second. But just to lay it up for the audience, to add a bit of context here, in a world where and this is, this, is, this is my experience in sales 10 years ago. In a world where most salespeople wake up each morning, right? And they just right. are a blank slate. They pick up the phone, the laptop. They start to do whatever in that moment might possibly at some point lead to a sale getting closed in the future. Why should they consider implementing a step-by-step -step strategy to reach sales success rather than doing what most salespeople do each day, which is just winging it? Let me just make it very clear for you. When you're just winging it, executing, you don't put the finger out and just say, what direction should I go in to get to my destination? <laughs> you take your phone, plug in the coordinates of where you want to go, and it automatically always reroutes you to get you to your destination. So you can either execute and hope for the best, or you can put in your coordinates and your strategy is always evolving, helping you, it's literally your GPS, to get to your destination. So I don't know what salesperson, frankly, what business person wouldn't choose to use a GPS to get them to their customers, to get them to the bag, to get them to their conversion rate, all the different things, the KPS, the cars that they want, instead of just hoping for the best by just jumping and predicating on win and algorithm and faith to get you there. So that that is obvious, right, Troy? We're not we're not preaching something that isn't uh, that is uh, ambiguous or is, is backwards here. In my experience, though, salespeople know this, but they don't do it. Is that similar of your experience dealing with uh, in the world of marketing and business consulting as well? One hundred percent. I think many times people think strategy slows them down. Mm -hmm. Strategy is part of the execution process. You need a game plan. You need to build the game plan to know how you're going to win the game. And I think we have to understand that instead of just gung hoing it and jumping into sales calls, getting the lead numbers up, and our conversion rate is really awful, honestly, our open rate is even worse, let's analyze and figure out who our target audience is. That's part of the work. And so the salespeople that are most successful, the businesses that are killing it in the industry or that are killing it in the game are the ones that take strategy as part of the execution process instead of just executing and hope for the best and then want to apply strategy after the fact. We need to let strategy be the lead in. For Troy, for salespeople who listen to this now and go, okay, right, I know this, this makes sense. Um, whose fault is it that this isn't implemented? Is this sales leadership for just going, oh, well, I've been given a quota as a sales manager. I've just split it evenly between our sales reps and I've just got, okay, well, you probably need to make 300 calls a month. That's what we're going to pay you against and a commission when you, when you close a deal on top of that. Is it their fault or is this something that salespeople need to take responsibility for themselves and perhaps d develop a strategy, develop that intellectual property that, travels with them from job to job, from a career in sales to a career in leadership and beyond as well? I think it's both. I do think I will lean more 60, 40, 60 being the sales lead, the sales manager, um, the executive staff or team member over the sales at 60%. Mm -hmm. But I do think if you have been in sales for a minute, well, <laughs> this is where your livelihood, this is where your bread and butter is, it's on you too a little bit as well. And I'll look at it like this. If you're the lead, and you have a sales department, sales team, it's to your best benefit to prepare them. I get it. We got to get the numbers every month, every quarter. I get it. The pressure is unbearing, even more so now than it's ever been um, as this pandemic has progressed and digital marketing and digital strategy and sales is such a high octane situation and everyone's desensitized to conversations and outbound. I get it. However, what if just by chance, instead of having them crank out another 10 more calls, 
10 more outbound for the day. You take that one hour and strategize the week, strategize the month. What are we seeing? What are we hearing? And let's just put that against the line and seeing if our open rates go up, if our conversions go up. I, I don't know what salesperson wouldn't want their numbers to be more of a higher quality. Yes, the volume's always going to be there. It's always going to be there. But if we can just do a little bit more that can help us increase it by even 1%, that's hundreds of thousands, not millions of dollars on the bank end of the year and the grand scheme of things. And that's where I hope sales leaders think about it. But lastly, for salespeople to think about that too. It's up to you to have a strategy that works for you to make your numbers better and make your experience better. Because we don't talk about that enough with the mental psyche and everything else when it comes to sales professionals. You've got to find that mix that works for you to be at your best at all times. How much of the strategy that you teach, you consult on, you're writing books on it, comes down to strategy to help people implement a strategy, so whether that's productivity or getting people over things like the fear of rejection, if it's, if it's a salesperson specifically, helping people have, I don't know, healthy self-esteem, whatever it is, so that they can put the strategy into place. How much of success comes from those strategies versus a step-by-step -step strategy to increase outbound uh, cadence uh, uptake and, and email open rates and things like that? I think it's more so internal. And the reason why I lean more, more internal is very simply, let's say you got 100 more sales calls end of every week. Let's say you got way more outbound every month, every quarter. Let's just say whatever number you've been chasing and trying to get to, let's say you get it. Now, let's say you get it and you get the same result, the exact same flatlining percentage opens, conversions, conversations, sales, the whole shebang you probably feel pretty bad. Like I I've been chasing this number and I got it and the result was still the same. Mm -hmm. And the reason a lot of that is the case is that who's going to turn down more sales, but do they have the mental capacity, the fortitude and the tech savviness, all the things they need to maintain that level of capacity. In most cases they don't. They've been chasing a ghost for so long. They didn't realize I don't have the capacity that if I acquire this, I can't maintain it. And so I focus less on anybody in marketing who's been a marketer for me, they can make the numbers look better. Anybody can. There's, there could be a spike in the data at any point in time, but not too many teach you and educate you on how to build sustainable, sustainable strategies. Mm -hmm. And salespeople of any profession, no matter your industry, you need to have sustainable systems so you can maintain the capacity for a long stretch of time. Otherwise, you're going to get burned out. You're not going to be ready that when you're in the fourth quarter, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big NBA guy. So when you're in the fourth quarter and you got to take that final shot, and this is for all the marbles, you flop the ball because you didn't have the capacity to handle it because you were burnt out this whole time. And so it's just conserving your energy. And I think it really fortifies on your mental capacity. And then from there, the tactics and everything is coming because tactics are always going to change. The how is always going to change, just like your GPS. S traffic, slow, everything is going to change. But where I am now and where I want to be doesn't. So as long as you have a strategy that keeps you going, oh, this is going down, I'm pivoting, I'm switching, I'm pivoting, I'm switching. And that's how it should work in the grand scheme of things. Are you familiar with the this idea of the 20-mile march from Jim Collins' books? I'm not sure. Please familiarize myself. So the, some of the regular audience, I talk about this all the time. Some of the regular audience will know this. I'll be like, well, why, why are you banging on about this damn book again? But uh, he talks about this idea of the 20 mile march of the, of the companies who go from good to great. They go to work every day and they march 20 miles. If the weather's shitty, they walk 20 miles. If the weather is great and they could do 60 miles, they do 20 miles and they plod on for years and years upon decades upon decades, constantly plowing forward. Companies who have uh, spits and spats of success, who have peaks and troughs of success will go, oh, today's great. The weather's fantastic. The wind's behind us. We'll do 120 miles and they crash the next three or four days. And I think, uh, and tell me if you agree with this, but I feel like sales is similar of you need to get, know your numbers, know what you need to achieve each day to reach your end goal, your target, hit your numbers, and then maybe do a couple more calls if you've got the energy, but maybe not. Maybe just 
get with the 20 mile march and be ready to do the same thing tomorrow because tomorrow you might not feel like it but tomorrow might be the opportunity you might the, tomorrow there might be the opportunity to close the biggest deal that you've ever done unless you show up it can't happen can it i agree with that 100 percent. i think success is boring <laughs> sure there's moments of sexiness in there but if you want really clear success it's boring because you're doing the fundamentals all the time yeah that's it I'd rather be more consistent and know that I can always hit, like you said, that 20 miles, then like I'm always chasing 60 and I stop at five mm -hmm. and the numbers are just all crazy. I'd rather have consistency over everything and have that more sustainable, you know, process and formulas to make it work. So in, in your book, it seems like there are different categories of uh, of strategy and, and different elements that make up strategies. And you've you mentioned one of the that needs to be sustainable. You also talk about it being simple and scalable. Now they both fit with what we teach in our training program or Seller Made Simple Academy. And our our motto, our, our slogan is making selling simple. Because I've found uh, and I'm sure this resonates with you yourself, because we seem to have a similar philosophy of a lot of this, Troy, that complexity just kills stuff doesn't matter how good your process is if it's complex and there's 27 steps most people get to four and then they just go back to winging it every day can you tell us uh, maybe some examples of of strategies or how this gets implemented of you know, of something that's was made simpler something that can be scalable and then you know the sustainability of elements of it as well oh we're a million percent in the line i mean <laughs> I always say, you know, most businesses die by the way of the three C's, complexity, confusions, and complications. They just, no one can replicate the success because they don't even know what's going on. The process and steps are too complicated. So people who are on board it can't fulfill everything. And then your audience doesn't know what's going on. So they are too reluctant to trust you. Therefore, they don't want to convert. Therefore, they're not exchanging and giving you money for whatever the product or service or solution that you offer. And then, ooh, things fall down. And so I really think that we do got to make things simple. Um, like I said, the, the success, simplicity is a straight line. And the more efficient you are, sometimes we got to understand that efficiency doesn't mean you're taking on more than you can chew and you're still winning. Sometimes efficiency is just one task for the day and being the best at that task. And then repeat, and then repeat. Like I said, major success is boring. I don't want to get a high in the process. I want to get a high in that we're getting those numbers. We're winning, we're winning, we're winning. And it's really understanding that. Now, again, strategy for a lot of people seems boring. Strategy seems like, I don't want to do that work. You know, you kind of how you um you get a instruction manual for something, and you're like, I'm too macho to read the instructions. Of course. I'm just going to figure it out and wing it. And you spend all this extra it. time. Yeah. <laughs> you spend all this extra time trying to figure something yeah. out. And then you have too much pride to go back to the instruction manual. And, then, and, then there's and always, it tells you right there where it is. There's always one <laughs> screw left at the end of whatever you're trying to build anyway. And you're like, oh, well, this, this is probably going to last about 15 minutes before it falls apart. <laughs> so I, I think in the same way, like I said, you know, strategy is part of your GPS system. And you need it is, and I also want to say it like this, and I know you align with this too. We have to repeat ourselves. We have to get it in our minds, what we're seeing, what we're doing, what's working, what's not working, the fundamentals, all those different things. So it may seem listeners that we're repeating ourselves, but we're trying to really take the time to emphasize what you need to implement within yourself and your process and your business and your strategy and your profession in order to get the results that you seek. And it's funny, and I know you understand this too, there's been so many times I'll have a client call or a customer or a brand come to me and they just want the magic peel. Just give me the sauce. Mm -hmm. And all I'm doing the whole time is asking them a series of questions. Troy, all you did was ask me all these questions. Well, unless I know all the details and the information, we can't build you a framework. I don't know what's going on. I don't know what you see. I don't know what your customers see. We need all as many vantage points as we can to then create the map, create the GPS to get us to where we want to be. And it's amazing how we still in the 21st century in 2022 choose to just run straight through the fire without understanding the full complexity of what's going on first in the situation, evaluating the situation, and then taking action. That small pause could be the difference between getting zero and 
5 million, 10 million, 100 million additional dollars in this calendar year or even this quarter, however big or small your company is, apply the ratio to you. Are you mean to tell me you're going to risk not taking the additional extra 30 minutes or hour or day or a week to process things first and then take action just because you've got the eagerness to just want to go? You don't always have to rush into things. If they're going to buy, they're going to buy because you've done the work and you know what their pain points are and you're going to provide the solutions to those pain points to earn their trust to get the bag. It's that simple. So we ain't in the rushing game. Let's come with our best foot forward so we can win. Let's see if we can get practical here. So I can, uh, I'm not trying to put you on the spot here as a B2B sales expert and tell us the the tips and tricks and hacks and, and steps here. But I think we can lead into your expertise here, Troy. Where would we start if we were listening to this podcast right now? Me and you were sat in the car, we're listening to the podcast and we're like, oh, that Troy and Will, I think they might be onto something. That Will bloke talks a lot of crap usually, but uh, this one is something I want to pay attention to. What would be the starting point to, or let me ask We'll go to the starting point of developing our own strategy in a second. Is it possible to develop your own strategy or do you need to bring in third-party expertise um, and third-party uh, people looking from the outside into a business scenario to be able to help build strategy? Is it possible to do it on your own or do you need someone to help with this? I personally feel in my time, 10 years of things, I think you can build it on your own first. I think you need to have an alignment of what works for you and then as things progress, you can apply the technology systems. You can apply all the different subsets of things that align with your sales team, with your marketing team and collaboration, communication, your business organization, um, and then outreach, outbound, all that stuff comes after the fact. But if you don't have the core nucleus of how you want to attack sales, how you want to acquire sales and have that kind of ironed out, bringing in a third party person is just going to burn more time, take longer to evaluate, which is costing you money and you're not making a profit from certain things. So I think you can start off by building it yourself and you're like, well, Troy, what, what do you mean? Where do I go from? And I know I talk a lot of concepts because I feel most people lack the depth of concepts. They're always going to do in tactics. They're galore. Software is galore. Technology is galore. Yeah. Best practices by top voices is galore, but the fundamentals are are lacking. The core concepts are lacking. So that's where my comfortability speaks into for many people who are listening. So I always apply first, I'll apply the dart marketing methodology where it's literally a dart, you find this stuff out and it's simple. You be direct, be authentic, be resourceful and tactical. What positions you to be the, your most direct self? Is that email? Is that live video? Is it that not honestly in person is kind of stalled right now, but you can still emulate that same connectivity if you know how to expound your language on LinkedIn and outbound reach and different things like that. How are you your most authentic self? What makes you your most authentic self? Is that email? Is that blogs? Is that video? Um, and then how are you being resourceful? I think the salespeople are the most resourceful people that I know because they're going to find a way to get the bag. They're going to find a way to get those numbers. But in many cases, that resource was expands on maintaining the ability of getting successful and then being tactical of which things you're going to apply to maintain that success. And so, yes, the core thing of that dark, direct, authentic, resourceful and tactical is a concept but through that concept, you can build a strategy built on your own personal per persona of how well you do outbound, what your digital platforms are choice, what's your uh, outbound reach of choice. And now that you've kind of lined that out, now I can get a third party person to build me a funnel or help me figure out how to use Hustle by CRM or how to use this or how to use that in tangent with my strengths, knowing my weaknesses, you know, my opportunities and my threats. It sounds silly, you know, this is sales one-on-one, this is marketing one-on-one, but I always lean on the fundamentals first and then expound out going there because ain't no gimmick going to help you if you don't know the fundamentals. Do we, um, and I don't want to contradict you here, and you might um, double down on, on your response there, do we as salespeople, and this is different perhaps if you're a founder of a startup or you're a small business owner who's also doing sales, um, but let's, let's lean into this idea that there's an enterprise salesperson listening to this. Do we start, is step one, I'm really good at writing copy. I'm really, inf I've got lots of influence over email, so I should do email. Or should we look at the marketplace and go, well, my buyers would prefer to be communicated in with on this platform in this way, even though I suck at doing 
in-person meetings or whatever it is. Uh, the answer is obviously it depends. But should we, if we need a starting point for to build a process here, should it be on what the market wants or should we really just lean into our strengths? I think it leans into what the market does want. But you have to learn how to convert your strength to match that marketplace. I know it feels like I contradict myself, so let me clean that up a little bit. <laughs> so the marketplace is going to point blank tell you, this is what we want. For us to give you the bag, you got to come this way. This is what we are used to seeing in this moment, in this season, apply whatever dates and ranges and timelines that you want. So me as a salesperson, me as the company looking at this, well, our strength is in writing. We are not live video people. None of us are. We, 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 we panic. We freak out. Well, if we know that that's point A is we're really good at writing. And to get to the back, point B is we got to do live video. How do we take what we do best, which is writing, and convert that into a situation so we can get to point B of live video being that medium to get to the bag? And to me, it's just figuring out how do I connect the two? So if you are someone who wants to go live, there's a thing called social audio, baby. <laughs> it gives you the same implications. You got to worry about your makeup. You got to worry about none of this other mm -hmm. stuff. And you're coming in, having conversations in bulk. Shoot, you can put everybody that you had on your timeline for the week and one conversation, start asking as many questions as you want. Your position as thought leader. You know, everyone's like, okay, yeah, I, I would have asked that too. And maybe by that, you're getting more conversions, doing less work. So now you're just scheduling bulk of social audio conversations in private settings or public settings and retooling that as marketing and sales funnels to get more conversations to the door. Well, and the way that you did that, you're reading off things that you wrote. You're asking questions you already have pre-written. Nobody know because your delivery is just reading the very concise thing and leaning in the shirt that you're always trying to do. So obviously that's one example. You can retool that for wherever it makes sense. But I definitely think the marketplace tells you the how. That's why I said tactics are always changing. But if you have your concepts down to the fundamentals, our shirt is writing. We're trying to get to live video. We're just going to build a bridge to get there. That's easier for me to work at or bring a third party person to help me after the fact, because I know that information, than to go at it blind, leading on my best strength and not getting anywhere. Dude, that is so smart. And you kind of double down on it towards the end of your answer there of a lot of salespeople will go, okay, I'll go on Reddit. I'll go on LinkedIn. I see that videos on LinkedIn messages are hot right this second. And so I'm going to spend the next three weeks spamming them to the whole of my audience and pissing everyone off. And then they move on to the next thing. And then the next thing, they're going from hack to tactic to tip to trick from a lot of the time, right? People who don't actually sell anything. These sold like 20 years ago, wrote a book, and now they speak on stage and, and BS about it, right? And, you know, and people should hold me to accountable as well. So people see my live sales calls. We, we post it on YouTube. Uh, they're all over the place. So you should take advice and tips and tricks and hacks and tactics from, uh, you should, you should think about the source that some of these are coming from because a lot of them are not statistically significant to the data that people are throwing out there that you should do X and Y. But what you said was when you lean into your strengths, it discourages you from jumping around because you're going to have an expertise in one, two, three ways, especially that lead generation. People are either going to be really good at writing copy. They're going to be really charismatic and able to do live video and be able to be quick-witted like you are uh, yourself, Troy. You're very quick-witted and intelligent. So I can throw questions at you and you can bounce back and look great on, on video. Some people might just be great at outbound sales calls because they don't give a shit and they're happy to be rejected all day, every day until they get the right person at the right place at the right time and they can strike up a conversation. When we lean into our strengths, which is what, you, what you're saying here, we almost eliminate like 50 other different options and, and simplify the whole process, right? I agree. And, you know, you know, you hear the thing all the time, quality over quantity. I know that's like, oh, <laughs> some people like I'm triggered, you know, like what's going on? The greatest debate ever. And I, I still think quality matters, but here's how I spin it. And I'm sure it's already been talked about on the show is that, how the content, how your process, how the pitch can be easily converted to fit whatever medium my client, my target audience, my ideal customer is. And if that same context, that same piece of content, that same strategy can fit like water in whatever mold it's in, it absorbs and fits the cup. It fits the shape. No matter what it is, it fits to its shape. That's higher quality to me because now I can consistently get more volume out of it that a higher chance of getting the conversions that I want. And yeah, I know marketers are just, 
we get a bad rep sometimes and those people do there's a whole dance of right and left arm cousins brothers mm-hmm. sisters the whole it's a whole mess between us i don't know why we're still debating here because we need both to get the bag we need both to work in harmony to make it work one is not better than the other if you're one on side, you may disagree with me, but I do think there's some harmony there. And part of that is understanding the dynamic of how you approach your process and your content quality can be converted to fit different things. I think Ross Simmons um, says it all the time that, you know, it matters how much distribution one piece of content can do, one process can do. If you can take one piece of content and distribute a hundred different ways, that's a very valuable piece of content. And even though it may take an additional hour or additional week to make, that's saving you time to get more numbers to have more conversations. And so that's just kind of how I see sometimes in that dynamic when it comes to strategy as well, implementation, you know, is finding that balance. Yes, we want the highest amount of volume, but if we're still hitting the same numbers and missing all the time, we got to reel it back in. I'd rather have a slight shorter volume in the interim and get my numbers up a little bit more and then go. But obviously, on the other side, I'm not trying to double down and you know flip myself out of my conversation. You do got to test. You do got to understand the marketplace. But you still got to go to your assurance and figure that out accordingly. How do I connect the two? Yeah, I'll go on the record. And this idea from, um, I think it's, uh, I had Greg McCowan, uh, author of Effortless, on the podcast. He tried to explain this to me in real time. I just didn't understand. It was a terrible interview. He was looking at me like I was a right idiot. I was like, I'm re- I'm, I read the book. I'm really trying to understand what you're saying here, Greg, but it wasn't sinking in. But we talked afterwards, and he summed it up with just a few words, and he said, do less but better. And I feel like sales is moving mm-hmm. towards that because now, 10 years ago, there wasn't the tool to automate allow a salesperson to hit a thousand people a week with calls, emails, and just generic spam. Marketers have been able to do it for a while with marketing technology, but salespeople haven't had access to do it. Five years ago, salespeople start getting access to these tools. They just ruin it for themselves, myself included, just spam the marketplace. And it works at first. And then obviously with the noise, everyone just starts ignoring it. And you can see a, a spammy sales email that hasn't been customized. The, you know, the person's name is in a different, slightly different font. And then halfway down the email, there's a weird line break where you've tried to insert things. You can see all this stuff from a mile away. But if you try and do less but better, and I think this is what, tell me if, you, if I'm wrong here, Troy, but I think this is what you're saying of rather than scale, get the percentages, get the numbers, get the effectiveness up before you try and scale it. Um, that in a noisy market has, has got to be more effective from a time, energy and cost perspective um, as we move forward from kind of 2022 into the uh, kind of post-COVID world where, as you said, at the top of the show, we're not really able to knock on doors anymore. And so booking those Zoom calls via intelligent outreach is going to be way more effective than trying to book zoom calls by just begging and spamming people oh i agree and i'll i'll echo this too you know i've been saying this recently you know sales marketing different teams in the present matter industry you need to embrace community more community is going to give you access to more forals they're going to open they're going to make those leads more warm because it's not coming directly from you it's coming with you in tangent with somebody else and I think what we're seeing is that even though you may be a salesperson, you can have your own community of people. We're not talking about a Rolodex of just people who may buy from you. I'm talking about a people who can evangelize and be an advocate for you. I always have to say this, you know, in a, in a conversation, relationship status of bay. You got buyers, you got advocates, and you got elevators. The elevators are those that just promote you, connect with you on social or other means. They're just there. They're cheerleaders, they're fans, all those things. Those advocates, they may not want to buy from you yet but they got access and power to open doors and says, just hey, this person, I didn't need them right now, but you may need them, blah, 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 then obviously the buyers. And I think we're now in a situation where we're less focused on just buyers. And I have your attention for 10 minutes. I'm gonna know in probably the first two and a half minutes, maybe a gut check too, that you're probably a buyer, you're not a buyer for me. If I know that I'm switching right into um, an advocate conversation, can you become an advocate for me? And if that's all else fails, everyone could be an elevator. That's just as simple as subscribe to my email newsletter, join this, join that, be a part of my thing. So I think reply, applying the st- relationship status of Bay buyers, advocates, and elevators um, is a simple way to start harvesting and growing your community, which you can do that in tangible of every sales call that you do in the hopes that you're winning by volume of it, getting more people to be advocates to get more money down the road for you too. 
So tell me if I'm right here. We're, it's almost like we're trying to build a uh, a snowball effect of we start just if we're cold calling, cold email, whatever it is. But then yeah. every three or four of those people go on an email list. We create content. We connect with them on LinkedIn. Then they're going to introduce us to someone. And then this rapidly compounds. Is that what we're aiming for? 100%. How do, because that's one thing to say, and I appreciate it. How <laughs> does a salesperson, and you kind of alluded to it there of, you know, in a call whether someone has, you know, the, the budget authority time need, all this kind of stuff. So we can pivot our calls perhaps and uh, and invite people to consume content on a call. That, that'd be one way of doing it. Are there any other ways or is there any way we can systematize that process? The reason I asked Troy is, Everyone knows it's obvious that we should be doing that, right? But then doing it day in, day out when we've got another call in another hour and then the, the boss is looking over our shoulder because we've not we've not done as many spammy emails as he wants us to do this month. How do we um, make something like a, a referral process like that happen? How do we systemize it? How would you advise someone to implement it so it happens organically rather than being something that you've got to remember and you, you're not sticking post-it notes on your monitor to ask for all this stuff to uh, to kind of make sure it happens uh, i can't say what the company is uh but i was tasked to help uh, marketing task force to help them simplify this kind of strategy for them and so the mindset was we were coming into conversations with three these three goals if they're going to be a buyer, they're going to check mark also being an advocate and elevator, almost guaranteed. If they're not a buyer, there's a chance they could be an advocate and an elevator guaranteed. If they're not going to be an advocate, they will always be an elevator. And so the conversation is less about, yes, you got to see if they're a good fit for the product or service, whether you're SaaS, tech, whatever the industry may be, or the product or offering, of course, because you want the buyer. But if they're not a buyer, we'll jump right into this next conversation. And so we've integrated, you know, in our CRM, in our CRM system, how that looks like, you know, where it makes sense for it to happen. And then we just say, hey, you just get practice. And a lot of it's just reps. You know, you're just retooling to, instead of spending those last 10 minutes, two minutes of a conversation, really trying to figure out why they said no, instead of just letting it be, because clearly we spent the first eight minutes it ain't going nowhere and saying, can I now instead shift ever so slightly and maybe I'll win you later instead of just, Hey, I'm going to email you and put you in a news you know, funnel. And it's just kind of like very cold and whatever. Let's put them in, in a different category to see if we can really evangelize them and help get them to help us close more deals and more sales. And so it's, it is, seems very simple. You know, there's a lot of logic to it. How do I implement it in my own CRM system? And I can't tell you all the, the specific of the technology and stuff involved, but it can be done and it has been done. And truth be told, maybe your competitors are doing it too. So it's just something to think about because at the core, at the end of the day, community is what's going to help you get more doing less, but being more efficient at the same time. So we do a uh, training product. I'm trying not to I'm trying not to plug the training product, but a lot of what you're saying is our methodology. So I'm trying to like, it the audience knows it exists. They don't need an advertisement for it. But to get in the training program, because there's a mentorship with myself and another two lads uh, involved in it as well. We don't just let people sign up. You have to do a call with myself or, or one of the team. Now, after the call, there's a bunch of different options. And that puts people on a nurturing email series after the fact. So people sign up on the call, straighten the product, everyone's rocking and rolling, they're happy. Sometimes people go, okay, that's great, but my boss in the organization, I'm going to see if I can get them to pay for it rather than me pay for it. So we click a button in HubSpot CRM to get a nurturing email list with a one pager that get that they can forward to the boss a PDF of what's in the training program and the benefits of it for the organization as opposed to the individual, um, and then get a, a series of emails just to keep on top of them and keep top of mind after the fact. If they just don't have the cash and it's not a good fit, whatever it is, there's a different series of emails because six months from now, they might be a good fit. And at the end of all of these sequences, it's, hey, is there anyone else that you think would be a good fit for the product? And when people sign up for the training product as well, we have a referral scheme within the, the product so people can refer their colleagues. And we get so much attention and traffic from just that one click at the end of a phone call to a series of emails that I didn't even write. Like we, we paid a copywriter to help out with some of it. I just give them a, a, a Microsoft Word document of a bunch of talking points and they did the work for us. We get so much revenue and attention and traffic from one click of systematizing this that it, it's a complete no brainer. For Oz Little, like sales.org is a tiny pleb company. There's no revenue really, right? 
and so for large organizations, even small business small businesses and small business owners who are doing you know five to ten million in revenue a year plus, this is this this they should be doing this, shouldn't they? If we can work it out, surely they should be doing it as well. Hundred percent, hundred percent. I think we shouldn't just react when changes shift in the marketplace. We should be proactive and just doing what we can to maintain our power, our stability, and our anchor in the marketplace and just saying, oh, we're good. I don't have to change. It's working right now. Yeah, but what if it doesn't work tomorrow? What if you start losing ground you know, next month? What if quarter one is great, but quarter three is like, mm, it, ain't, it ain't what it needs to be. And so we just always should have at least a good amount of our time being aware of understanding the marketplace and how do we make sure that we're maintaining that level within the marketplace. And I agree with that 100%. Sure. And, and uh, I guess a side note, I like the psychology of this. I've never thought about this before with our own process, but it makes sense of when I jump on a call, one of the team jumps on a call to, and it's a sales call. You know, if people want to get signed up, they have to go through us and we, we qualify them, make sure they're a good fit and make sure that we can help them before we take anyone's cash. Um, but it's, you know, it's a sales call. We'll, we'll influence people to get signed up if they're a good fit and we want to work with them. Um, the way the system I've just, just described, if other people, imp- and you, you went through a previous, Troy, if people could implement that, it means that it's very difficult to get rejected in that scenario. It's very difficult to have a bad sales call if the worst case scenario, someone isn't qualified, they're not a good fit, but you're still going to send them content or help them out, answer questions and then build that relationship over time. I bet if people thought about the sales calls that way, and they can think about it that way with just a tiny bit of automation or just a few notes in your calendar to follow up in a certain way rather than just ghost the prospect because they've not got the budget right now this quarter to get a deal done. It it reframes the whole sales conversation into a place and a position where salespeople are going to be more excited to do them because you're not just going to get the phone slammed down on your face and your prospects are going to be more at the end of the call, excited about potentially working with you in the future because you've not just got your pitch in a traditional sales scenario and just trying to ram it down there and then again, hung up if it's not a good fit. Do you feel there's something to that, the kind of psychology of some of this? Oh, I agree. I mean, let's think of it like this. You go in any course whatsoever, you know, sure. And this may be a slight different of approach, but I speak in analogies all the time to help people who may not understand the, the core concepts of things is pass or fail. A lot of times we'll come into a sales call, we got to get the back, we got to get the yes, we got to get the confirmation, or we don't, and this was a waste of my time. Versus every time that I spend with someone, I win something. I either win the contract, I win to go to the next round in the conversation, or I win a new advocate who's going to open the door for places I can't get in or my team couldn't get in before just off their recommendation because I switched the conversation and identified this is no longer a buyer. Where do I shift on next to this conversation? And if by the end, maybe they appreciate the way that I approach it. Now they're back in the conversation as a buyer. Instead of going pass or fail, I just want to go a great level. Obviously, I want to get the A, but C is passing too. And if I'm getting a D, at least I'm aware of, here's some things I need to modify. Maybe it's for this particular, maybe it's anomaly. Maybe it's a specific industry. Maybe it's a certain title or a certain person I was talking to. But why? Versus just pass or fail. I get the bag or I don't. I get the sell or I don't. That takes the pressure off of psychologically too. Because like you said, we're coming into the conversation now. Not let, it's no, it's no, we don't lose. And now, I don't know, you know, what situation you've been in a salesperson where you don't feel like you don't take an L? You know, you feel like you're always taking that. But if I can come into a situation where, okay, that I didn't get the sale, but it's not like I can't get a sale through this conversation, through this connection, that's a different mindset. And I think that's very beneficial when we're dealing with building community instead of just going at it, you know, gun hole, like a sharpshooter here trying to win all by yourself. Let me evangelize and get you to join my team. If I can have 10 calls then yeah, they told me no, that they're not a direct buyer, but they, over the span of the year, can each person give me 10 new buyers? I think that's a win too. It's a longer game. It's not an immediate gratification, but in long grand scheme of things, we go back to the whole calendar year, the numbers look really good. 
Yeah. And and some of this is a sales leadership issue of quarterly targets and, and sure. the, the goals resetting and goalposts changing. But some of that will change. And we've seen that in the marketplace change over time as a lot more products move to subscriptions. So just getting those numbers done, that's not as important as a good you know customer success and keeping people on the subscriptions and retaining them for longer periods of time. So we're slowly... Just slowly dragging sales out of the dark ages and, and following in your marketing footsteps, Troy. With that, mate, we've covered a lot of ground here. I appreciate you. appreciate you coming on the show. Tell us where we can find out more about you. Tell us about the podcast and where we can find that and then the book as well. Just like Will, I'm also on the Hustle Podcast Network. Um, I digress on the word. I know I got all weird with the spelling. I digress.fm. Um, I talk on concepts. I talk about marketing, strategy, growth, um, a little bit of sales, but I come from the perspective of I want to bring access to people who are in SMBs or are emerging brands who don't have the time or the team to know all the acronyms, to know the depth of marketing and growth and sales and business. And so I try to make things as simple as possible in that range. So if this lands in some way, shape or form, um, you want, you want to activate your mindset, you want to amplify your marketing and you want to achieve more profitability and very core, simple concepts. My podcast can be really good for you. It's also why I wrote the book, uh, strategize up as well. Um, to help people really make it simple, make it practical, and make it sustainable in their business growth. Amazing stuff. Well, I'll link to all of that in the show notes of this episode over at salesman.org. And with that, Troy, I want to thank you again for joining us on the Salesman Podcast. I appreciate it. Thank you so much.